Welcome to A New Earth, Awakening to Your Life's Purpose, a worldwide web event. Brought to you by Chevy, technologies that go from gas-friendly to gas-free. Sponsored in part by Post-it Flags, find what matters fast. Sponsored in part by Skype, bringing people closer with video calling. Welcome to our second New Earth webcast. It uh, is one of my greatest joys to unite all of us around the world and share the possibilities of awakening together. Along with a multitude of North Americans, we also have students registered in this class from countries like Afghanistan, Argentina, Belgium, Brazil, Croatia, Denmark, Egypt, Ireland, South Africa, and even a few of you from Zanzibar, I hear. Thank you. Since last week, 1,860,000 of you have streamed or downloaded our first class. I just want you to know it's always available. If this uh, pioneering effort again tonight should break up and uh, we have webcast problems, you can go to Oprah.com tomorrow or iTunes and begin streaming afternoon. Well, for the next nine weeks, author and spiritual teacher Eckhart Tolle and I plan to be right here in our virtual classroom on Oprah.com, Monday nights at 8 p.m. Central to discuss each chapter and talk with you about it. And you can type in your questions on the right side of your screen and send that to us instantly. And throughout this class, we're going to also talk directly to students via Skype. So cool. Free software that allows you to make internet and uh, video phone calls all over the world. Welcome again, Eckhart Tolle. Thank you. Thank you. Well, last week you shared with us how there are tools that we can use to bring ourselves into the present moment. And you were saying uh, from that first chapter that, and throughout this book that there is only the present moment. And you were saying that if we would allow ourselves to take ourselves out of our mind um, and just go to our breath, that, that we could, could learn presence that way. That's how you begin to learn presence. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I suggest that we all do that right now, which is to say we are taking our attention right now away from where it usually dwells, which is in the head and in the thinking mind, mm -hmm. and we direct our attention to our breath. And the simple question that one could ask is, or you could ask yourself is, am I still breathing? Let's just check if I'm still breathing. Now, how do you find out whether you're still breathing? You have to take your attention away from the thinking mind mm -hmm. and sense yourself breathing right now. Mm -hmm. And as you're taking attention away from the thinking mind, which always works using past and future, it sustains itself by always generating past and future thinking, mm -hmm. you also enter the present moment when you take attention away from thinking, direct attention to your breathing. You're always breathing, but usually you're not aware of it. That's right. And now we are bringing awareness to it, which means we are taking attention away from thinking. So we are not losing consciousness, we are very conscious, but thinking much less or perhaps not at all. So let's do this now. This has never been done on television, it's unprecedented, <laughs> but we can do it here. Yes. Yeah, silence is usually not good on TV. No. <laughs> <laughs> but let's try it for yes. the next 10 seconds. 10 seconds. Just be aware of yourself breathing. I'm still alive. Yes. I just checked in. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And in perhaps even more alive than when you're engaged in thinking. There is a deeper sense of aliveness there that you're one is beginning to touch when you get in touch with that, these inner processes. Yeah. I think that's pretty cool that all around the world and all of these different countries I just named, that all of us come together in silence for a moment just to give our mind a break. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, this is the most exciting chapter. 
until you get to the next chapter. <laughs> I think chapter two is the most exciting chapter. As we said last week, uh, chapter one is pretty uh, conceptual, you would agree. Yes. Even you're the one who wrote it. Yes. Pretty conceptual. But in chapter two, titled Ego, The Current State of Humanity, we get into, I think, uh, a way of understanding ourselves that perhaps so many people we're not aware of until beginning to read this. So I would just like to just get right into the, to this chapter. When you say, when you don't cover up the world with words and labels, a sense of the miraculous returns to your life that was lost a long time ago when humanity, instead of using thought, became possessed by thought. What do you mean by that? Yes. Now usually, and everybody can verify this in their own experience, uh, we experience the phenomenal world, whatever we experience, not, we do not experience it directly, it is overlaid with self-talk, which are the mental processes. So as you go about your life, you encounter situations, you meet people, you do your work, and most of the time there is a voice in the head, which is the, can be called the self-talk, it can be called uh, the inner voice, it's, but it is the conditioned thought processes, and they are commenting and interpreting and mentally labeling whatever it is you're perceiving or experiencing. So there's always a running commentary in people's heads. Mm -hmm. So they, they don't relate to the world directly and immediately, but through the veil of the self-talk. Mm -hmm. So when, and this, um, greatly decreases the sense of aliveness, the sense of how you, how you relate to the, mm -hmm. uh, to the outer world and especially to human being. For example, if every time I meet another human being, I immediately have certain thoughts and judgments in my head that come up the moment I meet a person, I'm already thinking something about this person. That's right, you've already labeled. I'm already labeled and so I'm no longer really in communication with that person, I'm in communication with my own labels. Yes, and what you said to us last week, and you also say in this chapter, even a stone and more easily a flower or a bird could show you the way back to God and the source to yourself when you look at it or hold it and let it be without imposing a word or mental label. And what you were saying in uh, last week is that if you can learn to do that in nature first, stop labeling things, just feel the essence and presence of things, it allows you then to be able to gradually move into doing that with people. That's right. Because so often we don't engage uh, with, in presence with people. We've already labeled them and labeled the situation, and so we're reacting out of the situations and not out of what's actually happening. Yes. That's what you're saying. Yes, we've already put people into mental boxes, and mm -hmm. so the, we no longer experience them as in their full aliveness. We have desensitized ourselves through this men continuous mental uh, conceptualization. We have desensitized ourselves to the aliveness of other human beings. Because the moment I, I put a label on another human being, I've already desensitized myself to their life. So you say the quicker you are in attaching verbal or mental labels to things, people or situations, the more, I'm on page 26, everybody, the bottom, the more shallow and lifeless your reality becomes and the more deadened you become to reality, the miracle of life that continuously unfolds within and around you. Yes. I go for a walk every day in the little forest at home and often I encounter people who are jogging or friends going for a walk and most people are... Some are listening to things on their headphones, whatever yes. it is, and they're talking to their friends. Uh -huh. And very few people are actually pr truly present there as they walk through this beautiful forest. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And this is a spiritual practice, and I recommend that people, whenever they go out into nature especially, uh, practice being very alert mm -hmm. so that they can perceive the trees, the flowers, the plants, the sky, yeah. without too much mental interference. That's so interesting because when I used to run all the time, I'd have all these people who'd run with their headphones and they'd say, what are you listening to? And even now, working out, I like just being and feeling the, you know, you know my feet on the pavement yes. and, you know, taking it all in. I like just sort of being with myself. 
and I find that the headphones and all that is a distraction for yes. me. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So that's a great practice. It's a good practice. Later, but you can even without leaving your home, you can practice even if you have a potted plant at home in your room. Look at the plant just for a few seconds, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, and just bring your attention to the sense perception and truly look without mentally saying anything about it. Mm -hmm. Well, Heather from Vancouver Island, Canada, is on Skype. Hello, Heather. Hello, Oprah. I'm honored to be here speaking with you today. Isn't this, I think this is fun, okay? <laughs> okay, go right ahead. Uh, Mr. Tolley, I'd like to commend you on a spectacular book. Oh. I found it thought-provoking, and questions arose for me. Uh, for example, when we get free of the ego, where does that energy go? Ooh, good um, question. Mm -hmm. Good question. Yes, thank you. The energy that was used up by the ego. Now, what is the ego? Basically consists of compulsive, conditioned thought processes so that we are not aware of. So we identify so closely with, the, with our stream of thinking uh, that we don't even know that we are thinking. So all this energy is used up in continuous to a large extent, useless thinking. Even psychologists have found out that 90, even psychologists who are not interested in spiritual things, they looked at the nature of human thought and they discovered that 98 or 99 percent of our thoughts are quite useless and repetitive. They're not really needed. So, where does that energy go? That energy that then becomes freed from thinking and becomes presence, which is a new dimension. Well, not entirely new because almost everybody has had glimpses of presence, but it is a dimension of consciousness that most people still don't know exists. Yeah. And really, this is the essence of the whole teaching. And everybody's had glimpses of it. I'm sure you have too, Heather, and everybody who's listening to us. Everybody's had just that little moment where everything is okay, where you have just a moment of bliss where there's nothing particularly going on that would cause you to feel that, but there's a, there's a sense of an awareness yes. that causes you to have, as you said, a glimpse of yes. something bigger than yourself. Yes, it can come accidentally. Sometimes yeah. it comes into people's lives accidentally, and it suddenly you feel a deep sense of inner peace and aliveness. And all rightness. Yes, and, and, all and, rightness. and not because something particular has happened. happened. Right. So it's, there's no external cause for it. It's causeless joy, one could say. That's happened to you, Heather? Has that happened to you? Occasionally. <laughs> yeah, occasionally. Yeah, and then you wonder, how did that happen so I can make that happen again? Yes, it, yeah. can, it can also happen when you're engaged in very strenuous physical activity. Uh -huh. and so that requires all your attention, like right. climbing a mountain. Mm -hmm. So you need to be, when you're climbing a wall, you need to be totally present every moment. Mm -hmm. If you lose presence and start thinking about what you're going to do when you get down from the mountain, you, you'll probably have an accident. So certain activities, very strenuous activities, require absolute presence. And some people become actually addicted to dangerous activities because they feel much more alive mm -hmm. in those moments. Because you need to be fully present. Yes, the reason why they feel so much more alive is because they're thinking almost nothing at all. Because you have they're to present. be present in be order to climb a mountain there. or to do strenuous yes. activities. Your yeah. attention is absolutely there. All right. Yes. All right, Heather, did that answer your question? Yes, it did. Thank well, you. Thank you so much from Vancouver Island, Canada, Heather. Well, Heather introduces this whole idea of the illusory self that you talk about on page 27. You say the word I embodies the greatest error and the deepest truth, depending upon how it is used. What do you mean by that? Yes. Usually when people say I, they refer to what I call me and my story, yes. which is your personal history that you identify with as yourself. So everybody has a story, of course, because everybody has a past. Now, most people are completely identified with the story that is their successes, their right. failures, right. things that happened to them, right. things that they acquired, uh, they see themselves as a victim, they see themselves as successful, mm -hmm. whatever it is, there is a certain story that develops. Because when you ask me who am I, 
that's what I'm going to tell you, my story, my that's successes, right. my failures, where I was born, what I did, what my mother did or didn't do. Yes. That's who we think we are. That's right. Now, what I'm saying is, and what all uh, spiritual teachings point to, is that that ultimately is not who you are in your essence. It is no more than a collection of memories, and of course, memories are thoughts. It is no more than a bundle of thoughts that you identify with and that you believe to be who you are. So that becomes an entity almost, a mind-made entity, a self sense of self, mm -hmm. like a phantom entity that lives with you that you then refer to as myself. Okay. So you have me and myself. For example, in Greek mythology, we have the interesting story of Narcissus. Mm -hmm. uh, Narcissus was a young man who lived, this is how the story goes. Mythology, of course, always embodies some truth that goes mm -hmm. beyond the personal. And Narcissus happened to be walking somewhere and he saw, suddenly he looked down and he saw his own image in a pool of water. Gotcha. At a time, of course, but they didn't have mirrors at the time, so it was a surprise for him to see himself reflected in a pool of water. And the story goes that he fell in love with himself. Mm -hmm. My view is that actually a better uh, translation is of the story is that he became obsessed with himself. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, signals the beginning of the human ego. It is to have a mental image in your head, ultimately, not out there, that's just the story, a mental image in your head of, that you regard as yourself. And that mental image is the mind-made me that consists of memories, things that happen to you, things, failures, successes, opinions, all kinds of things, I've described them in the book, together make up this I. It well, if I'm not the memories and I'm not the things that happened to me and I'm not my story, then who am I? That's the question. And in fact, who am I is actually a question that in some spiritual, Eastern spiritual teachings is used as a kind of mantra or pointer that you repeat to yourself in a meditation setting so you sit down and you ask, you ask yourself, who am I? And you're not supposed to answer that question. You leave the blank after the question. In that blank, in that empty space, if it works, if this practice works as mm -hmm. it should, you suddenly get a s sense of your own presence mm -hmm. that has nothing to do with your thought processes. Your own sense of conscious presence, your beingness, your presence, which part of which is actually also your physical presence, but as a sense of aliveness. Mm -hmm. Every cell of the body becomes part of that sense of presence and aliveness. So as we sit here, we can perhaps see if we can get a little glimpse of that, a glimpse of our own presence, which again is nothing to do with thinking. It is, it is deeper than thinking. How do we get a glimpse of it sitting here? We get a glimpse of it. I recommend that see if you can feel the inner aliveness in your body as you sit here. Is there any sense in which you can feel that, you're, that there is an aliveness in every cell of the body? Now, if people... But isn't my mind thinking that? Your mind may be thinking, yes, of course I'm so, so alive. Like in the book, you say, feel the aliveness in your hands. Okay. Yes. When I go to feel the aliveness in my hand, I can't feel the aliveness in my hand unless I had a mind in which to feel that. No. And so if you close your eyes and you hold out your hand like yes. this... Yes, yes. And then you, the question... You feel the, the vibrating sensation in your hand. Yes. You ask yourself... For example, I always have this exercise for people who have no idea what I'm talking about when I talk about inner body. Okay. Well, there would be a lot of people right now. <laughs> Go ahead. So you hold your hand and yes. close your eyes and then ask yourself how, without touching anything and without moving my hand, how can I know whether my hand is still here? How can I know that? Now, your mind might say, of course I know it because I remember seeing it just a few yeah. seconds ago. And I feel it right uh, here. That's, uh, that's it. You need to, you feel the inside is alive 
a subtle sense of a warmth or a tingling, a right. subtle sense right. of aliveness. Yes. That is the beginning of getting in touch with your inner body, the energy field. But do I need my brain to do that, though. Uh, you need your conscious attention to do that, okay. but not thinking. Not thinking. No, that's the difference. You need attention, which is consciousness. Mm -hmm. Yes, you need consciousness to feel it, but the consciousness then moves from where it usually is, just as it did when we started today with becoming aware of our breathing, our, breathing. our breath. Now the consciousness moves into the hand. And if you can feel your hand, if you can feel one hand, you can also feel the other hand. If you can feel both hands at the same time, you can perhaps also feel your both arms. Right. And if you can feel the arms, perhaps you can also feel your feet. Okay, and as I begin to feel that, and everybody who's with us around the world feels that, then what? This means this, the, the inner body, which we also could call this is, what we are doing is we are practicing embodiment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This keeps you in the present moment and keeps you present. It keeps you out of the, your thought out, processes. Out of your thought processes, thinking about what I need to do tomorrow. Yes. And it takes you out of ego, because the ego lives in your thought processes, consists of thought processes. Okay. So the moment you enter the inner aliveness of the body, you, are, you sense, there is a sense of self that is deeper than thinking. You are that aliveness that you feel. You are that alive presence. And so, and this applies whether your past or your personal history is a happy one or an unhappy one, for most people, it's a very mixed story, mm -hmm. but no personal history is entirely happy. Right. Uh, with very few examples, and then you just have to wait a little while until it becomes unhappy again. Yeah, even the people who say, I had a great childhood. Yeah. No, personal histories are all very problematic, yeah. and it's not, and people think, oh, it's only me. It's everybody. Everybody's personal history. Because that's what being a human is. Yes. Okay. So to be able to step out and find a dimension that has nothing to do with your past and your history or whether you are a, a miserable failure in the eyes of mm -hmm. your, the world or your thoughts processes or greater, has nothing to do with that. I love it when you say what you usually refer to when you say I, I'm on page 28, is not who you are by a monstrous act of reductionism, yes. which is a great way of putting it. Um, the infinite depth of who you are is confused with a sound produced by the vocal cords or the thought of I in your mind and whatever the I has identified with. So what do the usual I and the related me, my, or mine refer to? You talk about when a young child first learns to identify my toy. Yes, that's the beginning of ego when the child starts to identify with an external object and you can see when when the toy is taken away from a child after this identification has happened, after it was, the, the child thought of it as my toy, there's enormous amount of pain in the child. The child will start screaming and saying, it's mine, it's mine. So the toy has been taken away. Why is it so painful for the child? Because it is the beginning of the ego. The ego has lost something that it had identified with. Mm -hmm. It's a misperception of who one is, and so it's very the painful. The child thinks that the, the toy has it's, something to do with them. Who they are. It's who they that's are. That's the identification. And that's why kids go into spasms yes. over a toy, and you're going, it's just a yes. toy. And two days later, they lose interest in it. Right. And so that's the beginning of it. And then and it's because they think the toy is them? They think it's, it's a part of them. It, it, it adds something to their sense of self, of That's who right. they are. And when you take it away, they think it isn't. Then they be, it's like losing a limb, mm -hmm. because it was, became so much part of who they thought they yeah. were. In the child's mind, that's a part of me. Yes. And then we grow up. And of course, the process continues. When we grow up, our toys just get bigger. They get bigger, and... We they cry because I lost my... Lost external possessions. Yes. But it's, of course, possessions is an important part of all the things that people identify with that become part of their identity, but there are many other things apart from possessions. Right. Uh, for example, social position, how others see you. Because you say other things the I identifies with is uh, uh, nationality, race, religion, profession, mother, father, husband, wife, so on. Roles they play. Roles they play. Uh, opinions they hold. 
uh, you can see, for example, when when people But these are, are roles. They are actual roles. You know, people yes. are mothers and fathers and yes. You know. Yes. No. It's important, of course, to fulfill the functions that you have in this world. And mother and father are important functions, as yeah. opposed to Your nationality to and your race and that's your religion. It's fine. You identify with those. It's things. fine to honor all these things, but if that's all you have, then you are lost in a surface reality that always turns into becomes painful and turns into conflict. Okay. Uh, you can see, for example, when people are discussing, and if somebody questions somebody's opinion, very often, immediately, they become defensive. Right. Sometimes even aggressive or start shouting. Right. And because opinions, again, is another thing because that people... Because my beliefs. ...mind, that they identify with the thought they hold, a mental position, and then anybody who questions that mental position immediately becomes your enemy because you believe you're being attacked. You're not being attacked, but the image that you have of yourself, and the, the opinion is part of that, the ego believes it's being attacked. So you're saying that whenever you can see that that's what you're thinking, when you can see the illusion of that, the moment you can see the illusion of it, these are thoughts in my head, this is something I've told myself I believe, this is something I've, I've told myself that I identify with, that the, when you can see that, the seer or the observer is who you really are. Yes, and the seer or the observer is the presence or the awareness. As so you're saying there's thinking. two of us at all times? Yes. There is the formless awareness and there is the form that a thought becomes. A thought is a, an, an energy formation. Okay. And so the, that you've just mentioned, the essence is to be there as the awareness when it happens. All right, I'm going to go to Victoria. Victoria lives in Maui, joins us via Skype. Victoria, hello. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> Can't wait and to get there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Oprah and Mr. Tolley, for this awesome opportunity. Um, I was diagnosed over 10 years ago with systemic lupus and RA, and I've been a really active person. But two years ago, I gave up my business. My health deteriorated. And I got an aha moment in this book on page 51. I never realized that I had unconsciously clinged to my illness. And I'm taking this out of the book because I put it to myself. Because it had actually become the most important part of who I perceived myself to be. How can I undo this identity? And how can I stay focused when I'm in excruciating pain from the illness to have the peace? constantly and not just fleeting moments. Mm -hmm. That's real. Yes. That's, a, that's real. Yes. Now, the most important thing has already happened, which is you have become aware that up to now you had been identified with the idea of I am a sufferer of such and such an illness. So the illness had become thought forms in your head and you had identified with these thought forms and took them to be who you are. And now the most important thing, your question still is still valid, but realize that the most important thing has already happened, which is the awareness has arisen, so you have, there's a space now between yourself and your thought processes and the image of yourself as a sick person. Now, Another thing, of course, in addition you can do is, for example, no longer talk about your illness to other people except when you visit a doctor. That doesn't, that, then otherwise, the more you talk about it to your friends, acquaintances, family members, the more you keep that process going. Empower it. She empowers yes. the disease. That's right. Yes. So if you just can take the decision now that from now on, I'm not going to talk about it, and if people ask me about my illness, which they're going to do because they're used, perhaps used to you talking about it, you say, well, it's, I'm doing all I can to find healing in this, and I'm making good progress. Go as far as that, and don't encourage people to ask you questions and just say, that's how it is, no more mentioning my illness. So you begin on the external level, not to talk about it anymore, except when, of course, when you need to talk to doctors. 
And that will have also a certain influence on your thought processes. And then you can gradually also refrain from thinking of yourself as a sick person and perhaps give less thought to your illness and focus attention more on well-being. Now you may ask, well, but if I don't feel good, if I feel it, how can I give attention to well-being? You can still do that. One way is to see well-being around you in nature because nature is just an embodiment of well-being, a flower, tree. You have a lot of opportunity tree. to do that in Maui. Yes, yeah. you are the best, you're in the best place. And also there's well-being even if certain parts of your body feel unwell or painful. And again, we are coming back to the sensing the inner body. There are always parts of your body where you can still find well-being in your hands, your arms, wherever. Take some attention into the body and see where can I, where can I most strongly feel, get a sense of well-being in the body. And then take your attention there. So you choose to direct attention to well-being rather than dwelling on the idea of illness. That does not mean the pain is going to go away, because she said she has physical pain. The pain may still be there, that's fine, but not as far as the pain is concerned. Pain, unfortunately, requires surrender. You need to see that the pain is there so that you do not generate an additional level of psychological pain which complains about being in physical pain. Because if the mind starts to complain about being in physical pain, mm -hmm. you have two levels of pain. You have psychological pain and physical pain. Got it. Leave physical pain. With physical pain, you just, uh, right now, this is how it is. It's there. Don't resist it. Don't resist it. Do what you can, as far as treatment goes, of course. But don't resist it. Don't create psychological pain on top of the physical pain. Are you following that, Victoria? Got it. Yeah, excellent. Got it. Got it. Makes sense to you? You know, it really does. It does, yes. Yeah. Well, and I do have a little garden in the back that I go out to a lot. Mm. Yes, because there's well-being all around you. And you can almost, one could say, you absorb it from, if you don't, if you can, are they contemplate all these plants and for the intense aliveness around you, contemplate that. Well, email us in the weeks to come and let yes. us know how this works for you, Victoria. I will. I will, Oprah. Thank you so much, Victoria from Thank Maui. Thank you. We have Anne from Ireland on the phone with a question. Anne, hello. Hi, Oprah. How are you? Hi. Middle of the night there? It's uh, 1.30 in the morning. Okay. Thank you. Um, and hi, Eckhart. Hello. This book's been so inspirational. Um, I have three young children, five, seven, and nine years old, and motherhood's one of the things that's motivated me to find ways to be happier with myself, because it's so evident that children are influenced by what they experience with you rather than what you actually tell them. Yes. And I see that the stress in my life has even had an impact on their health. And I found the ideas in a new earth helpful in this way because I'm practicing being present with them and really enjoying my time with them not thinking about work and thinking about the things I should be doing around the house, but just spending time with them and being with them. And I'm seeing that the individuals that they really are and, and who I am. Are there other ways to introduce these ideas to small children like that? Good. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, now, you've already mentioned the most important thing is your own state of consciousness at home because the children absorb from you your predominant state of consciousness. And if you can be present with children at home, present means to give them full attention. When you are present, you don't want anything from them. You just give them attention, which could be listening, it could be watching them as they play. Now, many parents don't do that. They give them attention, but it's always wanting something. They say, do this, don't do that. Now this need, needs to get done. So that is, I call that form-based attention. Mm -hmm. That has its place, of course. Of course, the children need to brush their teeth. They need to tidy up their room. This is fine. It has its place. But the more is needed. Your child wants to be acknowledged in his or her being. So it is vital to give the child conscious attention at home. This give the child space to be. Doesn't need to be long, just a few minutes every day. Be there 
be present for the child. That's vital. Another thing uh, that is important is uh, there comes a stage in a young child's life when they start asking, they want, the mind wants to absorb concepts, so they start asking what things are called. Mm -hmm. What's this, mum? What's, what's that? Course, what's yes. that? And so at that point, usually, of course, you have to tell them this is a tree or yes. this is that and that's Rabbit. that. <laughs> yes. Bird. Yes. Yes. And the important thing is so that the child does not, at that stage, immediately lose him or, self, him or herself in concepts and then believe that the moment they know that this is a bird, the danger is, the moment you know that it's, this is a bird, you're no longer really looking at the bird. You have the concept of bird in your right. head, and then you just briefly glance at a bird, and immediately the concept bird comes into your mind, and so you're, you've, come, you've become deadened to the aliveness that is there in the bird. Right. And that has been, the, the, unfortunately, the fate of all of us growing up. We, had, we, had become, we became lost in a world of conceptualization. Correct. And so that this doesn't happen to the young child, of course, you, you, you have to tell the child what it is called. Right. But I would suggest, for example, not to, not to say to the child, uh, this, is, this is an oak tree. Say, this is called an oak tree. Because it's not an oak tree. It's the, the oak tree is just a word. <laughs> when, we, when we lose ourselves in concepts, we mistake a word for the thing. For the thing. Got so the, it. The, when I say this is an oak tree, that's a, it's not an oak tree. The oak tree is just a word. So I lose my relationship with the oak tree when I believe now I know what it is. And every time for the rest of my and life... When you believe you know what it is, it loses its magic. Yes, it loses... the, the essence. Magic is a good word. The world loses its miraculous quality yeah. and, and its aliveness. So after you've given the child the concept, encourage the child to continue to experience the tree. Encourage the child to touch the bark of the tree and to, to, look, to look at the leaves, see how the sunshine... sunshine uh, um, how the sun shines through the leaves of the tree. Encourage the child to continuously still experience the reality of the tree rather than dismiss it. You got that, Anne? You got that? I do, yeah, I can see, but that'd be very helpful. Yeah, that would be very helpful. Thank you very much. Let's move on to content and structure of the ego. On page 34, everyone, if you're following uh, tonight's class as we move through chapter two, chapter th two, I, it's very exciting when you really get these concepts of the ego. You say that there's, there's the egoic mind is completely conditioned by the past. Its conditioning is twofold. It contents, consists of content and structure. What do you mean by that? Uh, content is whatever it is that you identify with and that then you take to be yourself. So that varies, depends what culture you live in, mm -hmm. depends on your upbringing, it depends on your personal circumstances. And content is different for everybody. It differs for everybody. Although there are certain similarities in, this, in the same cultural field, like there are certain similarities that in America or in, in France or whatever country you live in, mm -hmm. there are certain similarities of things that pertain to that particular nationality that we would identify with. Nevertheless, from person to person, yes, it differs. The content differs. One person may identify with very strongly held religious beliefs and believe that everybody else is evil who does not hold these religious beliefs. Mm -hmm. That would be a very rigid ego. Mm -hmm. Or another person identifies very strongly with uh, the company they work for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. uh, and they feel, I've heard stories in, in Japan where, where people, when they got dismissed from their job, they committed suicide. They were so identified with their company that when they lost their job, which, which until recently was very rare apparently in Japan, mm -hmm. you would keep your job for the rest of your life, mm -hmm. so it became part of who, who you thought you were, mm -hmm. that led to, and if they didn't commit suicide, they suffered dreadfully because their identity got taken away. All that, of course, is pseudo-identity. It's not, it's not who you truly are. It's mm -hmm. part of the ego. And all that is content. The structure of the ego basically consists of identification. The ego seeks something or things to identify with. 
what it is doesn't really matter. For one person, one person identifies him or herself with a very uh, positive looking ego, meaning I'm, I'm the greatest thing that ever lived. Mm -hmm. That might be a delusion, probably right. is, but, but it's... Or another person might identify with a very negative ego image, like I'm the most wretched person that has ever lived. Life has treated me so unfairly. I've suffered so much more than you. Let me tell you about it. Mm -hmm. Many egos are like that. They are just as strong as egos who think they are the greatest. So the ego can be predominantly negative. It can be predominantly positive. But in either case, it's ego. Capsulize for us what, you know, I know the whole chapter is about uh, the current state of humanity being the ego. But can you put in a capsule what it is, the ego? The ego is a false sense of self based on mental concepts. It, so that's a, it's And our a identification phantom. with form. Is identification with form. Things. These are, these are, Yes. But why do we have it, though? Why do we have an ego? We're, we're, we're all human. We all have one, right? Yes. We all have one. Yes. You say yours, last week you said yours died. Does that mean you don't have one? You yes. said yours died in that moment where you wanted to kill yourself. I am so miserable. I can, no, I can live with myself no longer. Yes. You said in that moment your ego died. Yes. When it never we, came back. It died forever. Yes. When we say that, it simply means, it sounds like some great achievement or it's not. Yeah. It, all it means is I'm no longer identified with my thought processes. Mm -hmm. I know when thoughts happen, I know they're just thoughts. I don't look for myself in some opinion that I hold of myself. Aye. In some mental concept, including the concept that I am free of ego. I don't think in those terms because if I had this mental concept, I am free of ego, that would be ego again. That would be ego again. <laughs> yeah. And, and this can happen very easily. So ego is any identification with form. Yes. Because what we really are is the awareness that we are identified with form. Yes. And the more you can become aware that you are identified with things, you create a space that separates you from the things. Yes, because the question is, when you're aware that you're identified, who is it? that is aware, what is, it is a new dimension of, a dimension of consciousness that comes from a deeper level of yourself. But how do we live in the world without things? We have to have things, we have to live in a house, Fine, nothing, we have transportation, nothing wrong with things, we, we have, have to, clothes, we have to be clothed. Nothing wrong with things, nothing wrong with thoughts, mm -hmm. nothing wrong with opinions, mm -hmm. but the moment you identify with opinions, uh -huh then you need to defend them, they, bec they become part of your pseudo-image. Right. There's nothing wrong with possessing things, but when you, when you become identified, then first of all, if you lose something, immediately you will suffer. I love when you say, the people in the advertising industry know very well that in order to sell things that people don't really need, I'm on page 35, everybody, they must convince them that those things will add something to how they see themselves or are seen by others. In other words, add something to their sense of self. They do this, for example, by telling you, you will stand out from the crowd by using this product, and so by implication, be more fully yourself. You say, in so many cases, you're not buying a product, but an identity enhancer. Yes. I thought that was so fantastic. <laughs> Designer labels are primarily collective identities that you buy into. They are expensive and therefore exclusive. If everybody could buy them, they would lose their psychological value, and all you would be left with would be their material value, which likely amounts to a fraction of what you paid. Interesting, because, I mean, I've been in situations, we even see it in, in, in the magazines now, especially for the Oscars or Emmys or whatever, the women are lined up in their gowns. There used to be a time when I first went, went on the red carpet to the Oscars, people were interested in the movie you were doing. Now they want to, everybody asks, the, the paparazzi shouts, what are you wearing? Who are you wearing? Who did your gown? Where are the jewels from? Where, it's all about the designer label and who got to wear what. And so our whole society, to an extent, is, is based on, on this. Yes. What do you have? Yes. And is it exclusive? Yes, you can see it. You just, it, I suggest sometimes to look, go through a magazine yeah. or, or watch the TV commercials from that point of view to see uh -huh. how often 
you are actually identified. Hold an identity rather than a, the emphasis on the identity rather than the product. The identity enhancers. Yes. Okay. Let's see some of the questions uh, you're sending us now on email. I have uh, Deborah in uh, Manville, Louisiana. Okay. Who says, I'm having difficulty transitioning from the beauty of my youth to living with a face and body that has aged. How do we let go of that kind of possession yeah. or obsession, especially as a woman in a society obsessed with youth and beauty? Fantastic question, Deborah. Yes. Yes. Fantastic question. Same thing as being attached to SP. the the identity enhancers of clothes and things and cars and having, 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 having. Yes. Yeah. No. That's a hard. That's harder though. It is hard. The uh, it's particularly hard for people uh, who are good looking. Mm -hmm. uh, that was never my problem, fortunately. But the <laughs> <laughs> I had other problems. <laughs> I had a. I had a huge mind that says, I'm the greatest intellectual. That was my identification. Uh -huh. And then I suffered more and more, and finally I had to let go. But, mm -hmm. So you're, you identify with whatever is the most obvious in your life. So uh -huh. if you have good looks, then you're most likely to identify with that, probably even more so for a woman than, right. than, than a man. And so... And that for, Particularly in our society. Yes. Yeah. And so for quite a few years that works quite well. And, but then at some point you realize that the body does get old. Yeah. And uh, time, the monster time, does something to yeah. the body. Yeah, I always thought this too. I don't know, Deborah and Manville, but I always thought uh, pretty women would have a really hard time. Because if you grow up in that is your identity and everybody says how beautiful you are and you're a pretty little girl and you're great and beautiful 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 when that starts to fade then who are you yes yeah and this is why it's important uh, even at an early age when you still feel very comfortable with your external appearance to already see if you can bring a deeper dimension into your life so that you don't live the rest of your life trapped in the surface dimension when you equate who you are with your external appearance, which is not going to last. Well, she says, I'm having difficulty transitioning. Yes. From the beauty of my youth to living with a face and body that is aged. Yes. So w the question then perhaps is, so what, what to do now? Yes. How do we let go of that kind of obsession? So first of all, again, the arising awareness is important that you had been, and to some extent perhaps still are, identified with appearance. Right. And then comes in a little thing that we could call acceptance. Acceptance, when you look in the mirror in the morning, you realize, yes, one can see wrinkles here and there. Uh -huh. The skin is not quite as vibrant as it used to be, and you can see it very clearly. And so some of these uh, people who had been identified, they regard that as a personal problem. They see it as if life had dealt them some b blow that it's not personal, it's, it's the destiny of every human being to grow old and to, inc unless they die, die prematurely, it's the destiny of every human being to experience the gradual decline of the physical form. So what you're experiencing is the destiny of all humans, all humans that have ever lived on the planet and ever will live on the planet. So I suggest, first of all, to practice a little bit of acceptance. They say that it's not a, my personal problem, it's the destiny of, of humanity. It's just my, my share in mm -hmm. that. And also, with that comes with, with any kind of acceptance comes a little spaciousness. Mm -hmm. Because here you have the condition. Yeah, it leaves that, a space between resisting it. Yes. Yeah. So the, wanting it to be different. Yes. So you have a, the condition, which means I'm getting old, or the body is getting old, and then you accept that this is what's happening. With that acceptance comes a little bit of space around the condition, a little bit of peace around the condition. Yeah. Uh, and then a very helpful thing. Uh, that is, instead of saying I hate my I wrinkles. Hate, yes. Yeah. Uh, so it's, and you can, it's the same process, you look at a flower, you have a flower for a few days and the same thing that's happening to your body happens to the flower after a few days, it wilts. 
or put an apple there and see what the apple looks like three weeks later. Mm -hmm. It just happens more quickly. But it's the destiny of all form to eventually dissolve. So Deborah needs to come to some acceptance. Acceptance of that. and see that it's a, it's the destiny of all of life forms mm -hmm. to go through that process. Mm -hmm. In addition, also, especially for people who have been identified with the external body, because it's been, it was beautiful for many mm -hmm. years, to take attention, even when they're still young, to what we've been doing here, take attention into the inner body, the inner aliveness of the body. Mm -hmm. Because that actually does not grow old. Because you can feel the aliveness when you're 80, it's the same way that you can feel the inner aliveness when you're 20. Mm -hmm. So instead of always stopping with the external appearance, uh, spend time sensing the inner body rather than always staying with the external. When you shared the story in the book, I forgot what, which page that was, the, the ring story. Oh, the lost ring yes. on page 38. And you told the story of the woman who had... Uh, was deteriorating and accused her um, maid yes. of stealing the ring, and then you asked her the question. Yes, I asked, you do, you, do you feel diminished in who you are now that you've lost the ring? Mm -hmm. Do you actually feel diminished in your sense of self? And at first she said, yes, of course I do. And then she stopped, for, and then she started going to within, and. I asked her, what your sense of self, take your attention, what does it mean your, to feel yourself? Mm -hmm. And eventually she, she was able to go deeper within and feel her sense of presence had nothing to do with the ring. In fact, she felt it more strongly because the identification with the external object had gone. Yes, and I brought that up, that story up, because you say that as she, her body began to fade, yes. that her inner light became more luminous, that she became... Yes, l almost light, almost like light shining through. Mm -hmm. She became, I've experienced that several times with people that I have known who got close to death, they had an illness, they knew they were going to die, and they lived in a state of acceptance. They accepted every moment, and those people not only became very peaceful inside, because they had relinquished all identification with the external form. All right. Uh, and so, and then something else that was deeper than the form, that all, the, all religions really point to that, that in every human being there is a dimension that we could call the eternal or the sacred. The formless. The formless. Let's go to our Chicago study groups watching our webcast at Borders on Michigan Avenue. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I hear Sharon has a question. Sharon? Hi, Oprah. Hello, Mr. Tolley. I'm Hello. so excited to talk to you. I have a question. I, I have close relationships to people who suffer from depression. And um, in talking with them and, and trying to be useful to my friends when they talk to me about um, a bout of depression or, or, or what have you, um, I find that there is an inwardness and a strong identity that they have as, as people who suffer from depression. And I wonder, what role does the ego play in, in depression? And to what extent is it helpful to sort of point them toward this definition of the ego, the, 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 the content identity and the structural identity? I mean, or is it unfair for me to, to feel that that should be useful, um, given that... Um, you know, there seems to be a, a strong identification with themselves as, as depre people who suffer from depression. Yes, that again brings us back to an earlier question, where uh, whether it's the condition is a physical condition that one suffers from or whether it is a psychological mm -hmm. condition that one suffers from, there is a tendency to identify oneself with the illness or with the uh, whatever it is. Right, I'm a depressed person. Yes, mm -hmm. and then... And I'm depressed because I'm identifying with my whole story. Yes. And my story is sad. <laughs> yes. And that would make me depressed, yeah. Yes. Uh, That's what the, people are if, saying, yeah. Yes, if you're very strongly identified with, the, with my sad story, which for many people, yes, the story is sad. I had a sad story, story for many years mm -hmm. until I let go of it. And you were in depression. You were depressed. I was depressed, mm -hmm. yes. And until one night I woke up and I realized 
that this, this unhappy self is not who I am. I could sense the I amness that came from a much deeper level than me and my story and my unhappy self. And I described that as the self that I could no longer live with. Mm -hmm. I asked myself, what is that self? Who am I? Am I that self? No, I am I. I am consciousness. I am presence. I am. I am. So the question, of course, is what do you tell your friend? Because it's not easy to tell a person that you are identified with an ego image, and very likely you will get resistance. Correct. They'll say, what is wrong with yeah. you? Yes. Yes. <laughs> they go, what is your problem? <laughs> Yeah. You, I would suggest doing it in a more subtle way, and that is perhaps uh, point out uh, the possibility of becoming aware of one's thought processes, of thoughts that arise. Instead of being totally identified with the thoughts, perhaps you can tell your friend what you have been doing for yourself. You can tell, then it's not threatening to the ego. If you tell something that you have been doing, You've been observing your own thoughts, and you're, you're m more detached now from your thoughts than you were before, and you realize that thoughts are only thoughts. They are not who you are. In a, if you can tell them about yourself, that could help. Yeah. Uh, when, when there's but many times, if you're depressed, I think you're so attached to the story. The story works for you. You know, the idea yes. of being a depressed person yes. works for you. Yes. So it's good. Sometimes depression c c comes in waves for some people. Mm -hmm. So you go through periods, and then it, a good time is when you come out of it, and then is a good time because then you're more aware than, than when you're down in the depression. Then perhaps talk to your, when you see your friend is at that point. This brings us to something you were saying at the end of last week's session, though. As you're trying to share this information, everybody, uh, with your friends, uh, Eckhart said at the end of last week's class that the most you can do is ask yourself, are you well ready to awaken? Are you ready to be um, more present, more alive for yourself? Because you really cannot bring other people along unless no. they are also ready. Yes, but sometimes you bring other people along simply because you embody a different state of consciousness, even while you sit with them. They may be telling you their sad story, but you don't buy into the sad story, nor do you question the sad story. You're just there as a spacious, conscious presence. Right. No resistance, just conscious presence. All right. And sometimes that transmits itself, and suddenly the person wakes up for a moment. I had that experience, I believe I describe it, I don't remember whether it's in this book or in The Power of Now. There was a, I had a neighbor uh, many years ago who, who always was... Uh, close to a nervous breakdown. Whenever I met her, she would come with extremely complicated stories of what other people were doing to her and how she... And she always wanted something from me to join her in her struggle against mm -hmm. other people. One night she was ringing my bell at 10.30 or 11 at night and to the intercom I said, she said, can I come up with have something very important to talk about? So she came up in great distress and said something about she hadn't paid the service charge the, mm -hmm. and so on, and uh, we had to fight them and so on. And I found myself going just into a state of alert presence, just in alert, allowing her to speak, no thinking, just allowing her to say what she had to say, feeling quite peaceful. And suddenly she stopped talking and she looked around and she had brought all these papers to look at all over the floor. Yeah, to verify her, her, her position. Story. Yeah, and yeah. So, and suddenly she looked around and said, this isn't important at all, is it? And I said, no. And she said, thank you. And she got her papers and walked out. <laughs> and the next morning I saw her, she came to me in the street. She said, what did you do to me last night? Last night, last night was the first night that I slept well in years and years. The first night after what that happened. What did you do to her? Now, the thing is, I did nothing. I was just there present for her. Mm -hmm. So there was no and doing. not buying into the story. Not buying into the story. Not, not empowering the story. And not feeding the, her thought processes. Not and not even not resisting their thought processes either. Uh -huh. Thank you, Sharon. Thanks, everybody at Borders. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Borders. Thank you. We have Kathy from Beijing, China on the phone with a question. Hello, Kathy from Beijing. 
Hi, Oprah and Eckhart. Hello. I just want to say this is huge that we can have this one conversation around the world. I'm a girl from Duluth, Minnesota, living in Beijing, China, and I'm talking to Oprah in Chicago and Eckhart. <laughs> I think that's my fun. question. Yeah, go ahead. My question is: I lost 30 pounds in the last year, and uh, for me, it has been spiritual work. It's not just on the surface um, weight loss. And now my friends are asking me about it and how I did it. And I'm wondering how to explain um, that it is this whole spiritual process. It's not just what you eat and how you exercise. But for me, it's been life changing. And they look at me like I'm like mentally ill when I try to explain all of that. Uh, a friend of mine and I were talking about this the other day about allowing yourself to be fed from the energy that's already there uh -huh. inside your body. I know what you're talking about. Checking in. I know you know. Huh? Yeah. Checking, I know you know. Yeah, checking in, being conscious, aware of what you're feeding yourself and aware of how you are um, in touch with your body to give your body just what your body needs. And so then it becomes not about the diet and the food and the how many reps you did, but about being aware. Right. Yeah. But most of the world is focused on how it's just the, right. the surface, what yeah. you eat. Yeah. Yes, it's being, being in touch with the body helps greatly because the body uh, knows what it needs. Really, the overeating happens because it's part of the... Ego, unconsciousness. The unconsciousness, unconsciousness which yeah. seeks a substitute for the sense of aliveness. Yeah, I can say that for sure. And you know that too, right, Kathy? Yeah, now I know too. Yes. Yeah. Well, now you know how to explain it to all your friends. Thank you. It's so cool talking to you from Beijing. What time is it there? It's 9 o'clock in the morning, and I am able to watch it successfully this week. I was like others and didn't get it last week. But oh, it's, we're still it's up terrible. and out. That's great. I know, I have all, listen, I have the Skype people and the Limelight people and the Move people and the Oprah.com people, and I just walked uh, to, to, through the hall as I, we started this, and I said to all of them, may the force be with you, and this is, my th this is what I'm doing. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> if you can make things happen. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Thanks. Okay, bye. Thank you so much. I want to go back to the identification with things because that is an issue for so many People, the unchecked striving for more, for endless growth, you say, is a dysfunction and a disease on page 37, like the cancer cell whose only goal is to multiply itself, unaware that it's bringing about its own destruction by destroying the organism of which it is a part. I heard we had a shopaholic on Skype. I saw that earlier. Did, did we bring her back? Mm. Yeah, isn't that? Yes. Okay, we have Joyce from Minnesota who is Skyping us. Joyce, what is your question? I thought, I thought this applied to you. Yeah, yeah, it does. And unfortunately, unfortunately it applies to my son as well. Um, last week, he came home from kindergarten. And I said, I'm so happy to see you. And I'm in such a good mood. And he said, oh, good. Does that mean we get to go shopping? And I thought, <laughs> it's rubbing off on him. So what my question is, is how do I reverse that process in him? Oh, well, first of all, let me ask you this. You, you, you're reading the book, correct? Yes. Right. So you've gotten through chapter two already? Yes. Yeah. So when you read that, did you see yourself in the pages? I did. Um, the one, the, the aha for me was in seeing of who you are not, um, the, your real self emerges through something along those my lines. My favorite quote, and in, in one of my favorite quotes in this chapter is when you can no longer feel the life that you are, Yes. You are likely to try to fill up your life with things. With things. Yeah. Yes. yes. Would that be what you're trying to do? That was me. Um, I've since I've started reading this book, I've gotten so much better. I I I'm not searching for that thing anymore. I think I was trying to find um, my identity in things, and um, since I've stopped that, and I really don't have any interest in that anymore, I've discovered so much more about myself. I'm artistic and I'm doing sculptures and just things I never did before. So it's working out great. I just want to know how to enforce that in my son as well, since he's only five. Oh, well, now the most important change has already happened in you. 
So you've become aware of the old pattern, you've gone beyond it, and it's inevitable that now this will, even if you don't say anything, it will transmit itself to your son also. When after a while your son sees that the importance that you give to acquiring things has diminished, then he will also reflect that this is how it works with young children. It will take some time. Yes. Because he, for, since I, he's been a baby, you've been a shopaholic. That's the way you described yourself to our yes. producers. And so that's what he has seen. That's what he's taken in. That's what he, yes. identify, he identifies yes. with as pleasure. Yes. And when you, when you say, I'm in a good mood and things are going well, well, let's go shopping, Mommy. Because that's what right. mommy's already always done. Yes. Another thing that right. uh, that perhaps you could do is to uh, point out things to him that are of intrinsic value that you cannot buy. So, for example, the natural world. Mm -hmm. to, right. to whatever you see out in nature is of infinite intrinsic value, and you can't buy it. So don't pick flowers, for example. Don't encourage him to, because that's the acquisition instinct, the mm -hmm. instinct to, oh, I want that for myself. Uh, why not allow the flower to be there and enjoy it for a few seconds as you look at it? So point out things and engage in activities, perhaps, that involve nature and see that is of greater value than anything that you see in the shopping mall. And it doesn't mean that you don't buy anything anymore. Occasionally you may come across something that looks truly beautiful, that speaks to you, and you may acquire it, but it's no longer compulsive. You say we need to honor the world of things, not despise it, but we cannot honor things if we try to find ourselves through them. Yes. And how do we honor them? You honor them by giving them attention. I sometimes, I have a few possessions that I love, and I sometimes I just hold them, look at them, they're beautiful to look at. If, they, if somebody stole them, it, that's fine. Somebody else wants them more than I, it's fine, you let go. There's no identification, but there can be enjoyment in things. Mm -hmm. You can enjoy a beautiful, you might come across a beautiful picture and you buy it. You might come across a beautiful fabric, whatever it may be, you see beauty there. And sometimes it will be enough to acknowledge beauty in a, in a shop window and say, oh, isn't that beautiful? Of course, I don't need it. And you walk on and you can, and that's a, mm. that's a, there's a lot. There's a lot of, that's a thought <laughs> I never had. There's a lot of freedom It's beautiful. In that. Let's leave it there. I can just <laughs> admire its beauty. What about that, Joyce? It's beautiful. <laughs> Let's leave it me. in the window. It's the same as the flower. You don't need to pick it. That's, that's a thought. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Enjoying, like you can that. you can walk around. I, occasionally, I don't do it anymore, but I sometimes would enjoy walking around a few stores. Or when I lived in London, mm -hmm. I would sometimes walk down Regent Street, all these beautiful stores. Window shop. Window shopping. Look yeah. in. Oh, how nice. Would I want to buy it? No. Uh -huh. Even if, if I you can just accept that it's beautiful it's and beautiful, let it be. Beautiful. Then, then let it be. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you, Thank Joyce, so you. much. Um, we have uh, from India. I don't know the name of this country. Priyanka. Sri Lanka. Uh, no, it's, it, no, the person's name is Priyanka oh. from Mumbai, India. Oh. When we try to change our bad habits for good, then aren't we trying to resist rather than accept ourselves? When we try to change our bad habits for good, aren't we trying to resist rather than accept ourselves? Mm -hmm. Yes. The it's not that you change your bad habits. The bad habits drop away when you bring awareness to them. So it's not me trying to change something inside me, but when you bring awareness to old conditioned forms of behavior or thinking, when you bring awareness to it, those old conditioned forms of behavior or thinking, after a while, be uh, drop away by themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's not me trying to bring about a change, it's the arising awareness, and then change happens. Like the lady we just talked to, she read the chapter on shopping, mm -hmm. and that immediately brought her, her to this point of awareness. Mm -hmm. And with the awareness, the compulsion immediately lessened. Eased, 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 eased. Yes. You talk about the illusion of ownership on page 42. You say the ego tends to equate having with being and lives through comparison. And you use a quote uh, from the Bible uh, that Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, Jesus said, for theirs will be the kingdom of heaven. 
What does poor in spirit mean? No inner baggage, no identifications. I never knew that's what poor in spirit means. Yeah. Yeah. How did you come to that interpretation of what poor in spirit means? There was a time <coughs> um, after I went through this inner shift, it must have been three years later, I was visiting my mother and she had a New Testament on her shelf. Uh -huh. I picked it up and I started reading. I could suddenly see the truth that was hiding there and that in many cases the conventional interpretation was the superficial one of what Jesus had said. Uh -huh. And that was one of the things that I immediately saw when he said poor in spirit, I realized it's to do with not carrying stuff inside so that your spirit is very light, it has no burden. Oh. And, and so there were many things at that time I read and I suddenly saw, oh, he was talking about awakening and about living, living in that free state of consciousness. It's wonderful suddenly to be able to read it and suddenly it all makes sense, which before hadn't made sense. You also talk about renunciation of possessions will not automatically free you of the ego. That there are people who have renounced all possessions but have a bigger ego than some millionaires. Yes. So if you take away one kind of identification, the ego will quickly find another. For instance, I'm a more spiritual person than you are. Yes. You see this all the time. Yes. yes. So it's identification. People use their religion to say I'm That's better right. than you are because yes. I'm or, or even an image of myself as a spiritual person. I'm more spiritual than you. Yes. <laughs> uh, for example, there could be, theoretically, you could have a man driving a Rolls Royce and then in the same street, a man riding a bicycle, and it is quite possible, not necessarily, of course, it could be the other way around, but it's quite possible that the man on a bicycle may have a bigger ego than the Rolls Royce if he thinks of himself as spiritually superior to the man in the Rolls Royce. And so the ego compares itself always to others yes. in order to find some superiority somewhere. Yes, because another favorite quote, quote is, is that any time you feel yourself superior or inferior to anybody, it is always your ego. Yes, and that's very interesting. You can observe yourself then in many situations because the ego always looks out when you come into a group of people or you meet new people and it wants to, to position itself somewhere. Am I, am I better looking than this person? Or am I more knowledgeable than this person? Or do I, am I more wealthy than this person? Or is this person more wealthy than me? So it tries to position itself and that then leads either to a sense of superiority yeah. or inferiority and both are ego. Yes, well what made me also think about um, one of the situations in our country in particular here in the United States is that people live lives in debt. They're indebted, credit card debt, overwhelmed by debt because of what you talk about on page 46, wanting the need for more. Wanting keeps the ego alive much more than having. Yes. Let's talk about that. Now that's again a structure of the ego yes. because we've been talking about content and yes. structure and one of the main structures of the ego is it is never satisfied. satisfied. Uh, so, for example, when you have attained a goal or attained something that you wanted... I got a nice house. Not a nice house. Nice and, things in the house. And after a little while, it no longer satisfies you. And that's always a sign that, that was the, the, it was an egoic Because I now need nicer things. Yes. And I need more square footage. Yes. Yes. So, uh, nothing satisfies the ego for long. And therefore, it con needs to continue to look for more. Mm -hmm. And of course, and this is uh, uh, to do also with the ego's need for future because it's only by attach attaching undue importance to the future because it's looking for more in the future moment. It seeks to complete itself at some point in, it wants to attain something in addition to what you already so have. So how do we stop that and begin to be satisfied where we are with what we have and who we are? Well, first of all, to see the illusion of seeking fulfillment in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes people need to have lived for a while to see that it, that's actually true. Right. That no matter what you achieve or what you attain, you're not satisfied for long. So how, what do we do about this? We realize that the thing that is of prime importance in our lives we had always overlooked, and that's the ego in us had always overlooked that. And that thing that is of absolutely prime importance in our lives is the present moment. 
the present moment is actually the easiest exit point out of the ego state of consciousness. Because when you're absolutely present in this moment, the ego can't survive. There's only conscious presence. The ego li lives through past and future. It identifies with the past, but it's not a very happy identity. And it looks to the future where it wants this, that, or the other to complete itself. Well, someone's asked me, one of the, during the week, uh, someone asked me, what about our past memories that are pleasant? You have happy times well, with pleasant good. memories. Okay, and so. when, you, when you remember those memories, it's also the present moment. So no matter what you remember from the past, mm -hmm. when those things happened, mm -hmm. whether pleasant or unpleasant, mm -hmm. Did they happen in the past? That's what we say, OK, these things happened in the past, but right. of course they happened in the now, because nothing can happen in the past. There is only the now. And when you remember something from the past, when do you remember it? Now. now. Mm -hmm. And when you think of something that may happen in the future, when do you think of that? Now. now. And when then think, that thing actually happens, when does that happen? Now. now. So there is no life apart from now. And that is a very important realization for people to have because the ego continuously overlooks the now. It thinks past and future are more important. It gives much more importance to past and future, and the now is just almost as if it didn't exist. And what you're saying is, 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 uh, is that if we can learn to recondition ourselves to be present now, then we can be more alive yes. to do whatever it is going to be in the future. Yes. Because even when the future gets here, it will only be now. Yes. The now is the foundation for the rest of your life. Because Got it. the rest of your life will also be the now. Got it. Madeline from uh, Pennsylvania is 13 years old and is on the phone with a question. Madeline? Hi. Hi. Hello. Hello. Um, on page 47, at the end of the second paragraph, the sentence reads, intense wanting that has no specific object can often be found in the still developing ego of teenagers, some of whom are in a permanent state of negativity and dissatisfaction. Yes. By stating this, are you implying that teenagers cannot be awakened, that although I'm reading this book, I may have no chance in reaching consciousness merely because I'm 13 and my ego is not fully developed? Oh. Go, Madeline. <laughs> <laughs> Go, Madeline. I just think the fact that you could ask the question is pretty darn good. Yes. <laughs> now, the first thing, uh, you are more advanced than I was at 13. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> than uh, most of us, I'd say, yeah. I, I would not have been able to read or understand that book when I was 13. <laughs> so, are you reading the book, Madeline? Um, yeah. Okay. That's quite amazing. That's quite amazing. So, it certainly does not mean that you... Uh, cannot be awakened because you're already awakening because if you were not already awakening the book would be completely meaningless to you okay. so uh, there's a new generation uh, growing up and there are more youngsters now than before who may not have to go through the extreme egoic delusion that we had to go through in our generation and you may be one of them it doesn't mean, perhaps, that your ego will not develop at all. Your ego will develop, but I don't believe that you will be as trapped in ego as I had to, had to be. I can't speak for Oprah. I know Oprah is fine Oprah now. Oprah was trapped. Oprah was very trapped. <laughs> Madeline. Oprah was very trapped. So uh, your chances are excellent. You're already awakening. It's wonderful to see. Let me ask you this, though, Madeline. When you uh, just read us that passage at the bottom of uh, uh, page 47, intense wanting that has no specific object can often be found in the still developing ego of uh, teenagers. So what you're saying there is that the ego of teenagers is still in the process of Roll. becoming. Yes. And also, Madeline, don't you see it in your friends, the sort of yeah. intense wanting? Yeah, all the time. Okay. So I think that's what he was talking about. Yes. He was talking about all of your friends, but not you, Madeline. Now, Madeline, do you detect intense wanting in yourself? Yeah, occasionally. Occasionally. Yeah. But you're not totally identified because you know it's there. There is an awareness there, isn't mm -hmm. there? Okay. Are you understanding the book, Madeline? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, actually. Wow. What, what, what grade are you in, actually? 
I'm in eighth grade. Eighth grade. Okay. Well, great to hear from you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Were you in Cannonsburg, Pennsylvania? That's what I hear. Yep. Actually. Well, great. Good. Thank you. Keep reading. Yep, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to check our live emails again. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Wonderful. 13. Yeah. I couldn't have. Yeah. Listen, I was in so much trouble at 13. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't have... Me too. <laughs> yes. Okay, as we make our way in the world, this is from um, Japan, Toyo Hashi, Japan. As we make our way in the world, being confident, assertive, our characteristics that help us get a job, that big promotion, I realize now that these are traits that are associated with ego. And so the question then becomes, how then does one move beyond the ego? Great question. How does one move beyond the ego? Become aware of the ego is the first step. But can't you still be the biggest jerk on earth and still just be aware of it and say, well, I'm a jerk. Boy, that sure, that sure is some big ego of mine. You know, you were talking earlier, I was thinking, you know, you can be in the moment still being one of those road raging people, road raging jerk in the moment. Well, and aware that you are a road raging jerk in the moment. Uh, it's unlikely that at that moment you are actually aware. Really? Uh, because if you're aware, then you cannot be totally possessed by, by the ego, by, by the, the ego. form, the thought form okay. or the emotional form. Okay. If that, if that Usually dimension... Usually that's the pain body that's taken over. Yes. Yeah. Okay. If, that, if the dimension of awareness is present, you are not totally in the grip of ego. And so, but the, the quickest way out of ego is to practice as much as possible living in the present moment, which means to give more attention to this moment than to the future or the past. To make this moment the, the primary factor in your life rather than future and past. Of course, you still use future and past for practical purposes. It helps to make right. an appointment, to go from here to there. It's all fine. It works very well. But it means being present? As much as possible. Uh, being open to whatever arises in the present moment. I, the word that I use, and I think it may be helpful for many people, is make friends with the present moment. Because the ego doesn't, can't do that. The ego always is antagonistic. It wants, at best, it uses the present moment as a stepping stone, because, stepping stone because it wants to get to the next moment which promises greater fulfillment, at mm -hmm. best. But in many cases, the ego actually dislikes <coughs> mm -hmm. the present moment, it resists the present moment. So if you can make the present moment into the primary focal point of your life and live, then ego will very quickly diminish in you mm -hmm. because it cannot survive the present moment. So the ego... So that's how you do it. That's how yes. one moves beyond the ego. Yes. The it ego... Be present. Sorry. The ego lives as if... People who are possessed by the ego live as if the present moment were their enemy. They, they, they are stressed. They want to get somewhere else. Whenever you need to... They're doing something, but they really already want to be at the end of their doing. <laughs> Come on. They, yeah. They, are, they, they don't want to be where they are. They'd rather be somewhere else. They don't want to be who they are with. They don't... It's, there's always a striving away from now, internally. Yeah. And that's, of course, the dysfunction. Yeah, of I just ego. had a moment like that today because I was waiting on somebody to get something ready, and they said, so are you, we're so sorry, we're going to hurry, we're waiting. And I go, no. I, I took the lesson from the book. No, I'm just here being with myself. Yes. Not waiting on anything, because if you're waiting, you're in anticipation and you're yes. wanting to be out of that moment. That's right. Yes. Waiting, waiting means you don't like this moment. You right. You'd rather have another moment. So whenever you are waiting, so waiting. to speak, yes. why not practice being rather than waiting, which means completely inhabit this moment and feel your body, perhaps, feel the energy you feel. To, and that's very... very very pleasant to feel that you're alive. All right. We have one last phone call. A uh, question from Michelle in Philadelphia. Hello. Hi, Oprah. How are you? Hi. <laughs> good, good. Um, yeah. Hi, Eckert. Hello. I'm just like a little bit so excited that you called me. Um, my question was um, that I'm a little bit confused with Chapter 2. I understand the quote, if someone takes your shirt, let them have your coat as well. But where do you draw the line without getting walked all over? I do not want to be an egotistical person, but at the same time, 
I don't want it to get taken advantage of. Good question. So I was having a little bit confusion with that. Thank okay. You. Yes. Good, good, good. Yes. All it says is sometimes letting go, there's more power in letting go than in clinging or hanging on to something. So there are situations when you actually become empowered when you let go rather than when you cling. It does not mean that people walk all over you. In fact, I say there are situations when you have to say no very clearly to, yes. a, to a situation or to a person. But even that no can be of they can, be, it can be of two different kinds. The, usually the no is very negative. When you say no to a person, the person says, uh, um, I'll give you a ride home, and you see the person is drunk. Of course, you wouldn't say yes just to be pleasant. You say no. Now, do you say no with negative energy and in a state of resistance, or do you say no that is positive? Well, you simply, it simply means a clear and straightforward, no, I won't do that. This is very different from the okay. resistance no. Yeah. So I call that the, the no that is not negative, a high quality no. To it's also looking at the reason why you would cling to the shirt. You can have my shirt if I'll give you the shirt if the reason why you're holding to the shirt is because you think the shirt, shirt is going to give you more value or more or you're operating from your ego when you're holding on to it. Yes. So you're saying be able to be in the state of presence yes. uh, and awareness so that you can surrender whatever needs to be surrendered. Yes. That does not mean, and surrender does not mean allowing yourself to be walked over, but to be fully present so that you can be conscious yes. of, of, okay. of, of what's always going on. Yes. So it means in some cases it's, it's fine to say, here, you want it, take it. In other cases, it's, it's not, yes. depending upon what the situation is, That's right. based right. upon okay. the truth of, of, of who you are in any given moment. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I got that, yes. Michelle. Good. I got <laughs> Thank that. You Thank you so for much. asking the question. It helped me to get it. So let's close Thank with uh, the peace that passes all understanding that you talk about on page 56. What is that peace? That peace comes when you live in internal alignment with the present moment, which means what is, whatever is. When you no longer argue with what is, when you don't fight it internally, this present moment already, always is. Even if it's it a is. situation that you don't want. Even if you don't want it, it is. You, you must accept it first. You accept first and then you take action. Because that was the mud example you used last week. Yes, you get... Even if you're stuck in the mud. This is where I am right now, I'm here. And then you take action, but that action no longer arises out of negativity, which is there when you don't like to be where you are, when you don't like this moment. Always friendly with the present moment, accepting the isness of the present moment, then move on from there. Then whatever action you take is actually empowered by life itself. Mm -hmm. When you're in a state of negativity or resistance, your action is not empowered by life. So it's not inspired and much less effective than action that comes out of the state of non-resistance. Right. It's like last week when we were having problems, which no, you, neither you nor I knew until yes. we had finished the class. And I said, we were doing a toast to everybody afterwards for all of their efforts. And I say, I'm going to accept it. I'm going to accept that we had a breakdown on the web. I'm going to accept it. And now let us correct it. Yes. And yeah. it was everybody's lesson whose, whose computer froze up. It was everybody's lesson to say, well, this is what is. And with that comes an inner peace that has nothing to do with what's happening not or not happening. Not resisting and banging up the computer yes. and, oh my God. And yes. Yeah. And that's the peace that passes all understanding because the peace cannot be explained with reference to external events. It's there because you live in alignment with the present moment. That's the peace. That is the peace, living in alignment. Before we say goodbye, um, I'd like to thank you for being with Eckhart and with me, and we'll be here again next Monday at 8 p.m. Central. Don't forget, if you want to experience this class again or tell a friend who missed it, our webcast is available on demand tomorrow for free here at Oprah.com. Uh, is that noon, Dean? Beginning at noon? Beginning at noon, you can start to download. And if you want to download a podcast of this class, you can do that tomorrow at Oprah.com and iTunes. Your assignment for our next class is to update your workbook and spend this week rereading and thinking about chapter three. 
Chapter 3 is all about the core of ego. So do your homework, and we'll see you next Monday night. Thank you again, Eckhart. Thank you. Isn't this, this the coolest? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you so much uh, to you. all of you. It's been yeah. wonderful. Thank you, everybody, all over the world. Good night, good, good day, night. good morning, <laughs> goodbye. <laughs>